Okay. So Are you guys there? I'm sorry. I uh, thought I froze there for a second. Oh, no, you're, you're good. You're there. All right. So let's get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our library's most monthly program from the National Park Service. Tonight's program is exploring William Floyd estate history. My name is Tara Moran. I'm a librarian at the Mastic Merchant Shirley Community Library. And I'm very happy to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Kelsey Cecina, park ranger with the William Floyd Estate. If you have any questions throughout the program, please enter them in the chat box and we'll answer them um, when we get to the end. And of course, we'll open it up to further questions then. So Kelsey, if you're ready, let's get started. Sure. All right, sounds good. Um, so you guys, you're seeing the exploring the William Floyd Estate pre-colonial history to independence. So there's a ton of history at the William Floyd Estate and I, uh, I really wanna dig in depth into a lot of it. Um, but this is just to say that we're really just scratching the surface of what we have to offer over at the William Floyd Estate. And I'm really hopeful that I get a chance in the future to maybe see some of you guys visit. Um, we are really excited because the grounds are open, will be open now seven days a week which is new, used to only be open uh, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays during the summer. We'll be open seven days a week, a week through the season. So we're hoping that folks will come out. There are all sorts of exciting things that I'll talk about later. I do have to say, unfortunately, the house itself, the old Mastic house that's in the center of the William Floyd Estate, it's actually closed right now. Um, it was closed last year in part because of COVID-19. This year we have it closed because we're actually, we're kind of excited. We're going to be doing a lot of work on the roof, a lot of work that is uh, long overdue, unfortunately, and we'll also be uh, doing a lot of cleaning on the interior um, and basically recataloging the whole collection, dealing with things like mold and stuff like that. So unfortunately the house itself is gonna be closed. But that's to say there's so much around the William Floyd estate to talk about. And that's kind of what I'm focusing on today. Around, I should say the old, yeah, the old Mastic house to talk about. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today. But I'm just gonna start by introducing myself. My name is Kelsey and I'm a ranger here at Fire Island National Seashore. Fire Island is the park that oversees the William Floyd estate. Um, I've been working as a park ranger there for 10 years now. Um, this is my you know, midway through my 10th season, so I have a lot of history here, both at Fire Island and at the William Floyd Estate. Um, my roots in this community go back really far. I actually moved uh, to Mastic Beach when I was just four years old. My family grew up in Mastic Beach. I lived a few years in Shirley. Today I'm living in uh, Brookhaven Hamlet. So I'm a local. This is something that I grew up with. I spent my entire education from kindergarten to 12th grade um, at the William Floyd School District. Uh, I was a cadet in their NJROTC program. I even wore the old William Floyd colonial costume, the uh, mascot back in the day. Uh, so I have a lot of history, a lot of roots down here, and I really love the Floyd estate. Um, I think it's this really complex, vibrant, dynamic place and there's so much history that we can talk about and I'm really just sort of scratching the surface. So I've lived my whole life near things named after William Floyd. I drive almost every day up William Floyd Parkway, past the statue of William Floyd to work at the William Floyd estate. Suffice it to say William Floyd is a name that I know well. I kind of grew up with that name. Uh, but when it comes to the William Floyd estate, William Floyd is really just the tip of an iceberg right? The truth is William Floyd has a really long, incredibly diverse community, uh, this amazing history involving all sorts of different people. And we're going to be talking a little bit about today. But, you know, the 4th of July just passed. We're in the month of July. So we're really celebrating American independence, which is why I was choosing to sort of think about running this program uh, to talk about the history of the William Floyd estate from the pre-colonial period up until like the struggle for independence in the revolution. Um, there's a little bit of information about the period after. <laughs> there's just so much information. I can't even begin to share all of it, I think. Um, so just a real quick look at it at, at Long Island. The William Floyd estate is situated, obviously, uh, right over here, um, right in the center of Suffolk County uh, on the south shore of Long Island. Um, 
The William Floyd estate is uh, really connected to Fire Island National Seashore, both in the literal sense. It is operated and run by the Rangers at Fire Island. Um, it's also historically connected to Fire Island. I mean, there's a ton of uh, history, a lot of stories about the family visiting Fire Island. Uh, William Floyd himself had claims to Fire Island. Um, yeah, and all, oftentimes whalers and all sorts of other people actually used Fire Island as a waypoint between the William Floyd Estate and the Atlantic Ocean. So there are all of these connections and you can see the William Floyd Estate there on this map. Zooming in a little closer, we can see Mastic Beach, we can also see Mastic, Shirley, Mauritius, Center Mauritius, and we can see that the William Floyd Estate is there sort of on the bottom right hand corner um, of the Tri Hamlet area. It's from just like looking at the satellite image, we can see that it's relatively undeveloped compared to a lot of the area around it. I will say historically the William Floyd estate, the William Floyd property is quite, uh, was quite large. It actually extended from the Great South Bay all the way up to what is today the Brookhaven National Lab. So what it, we know today as the William Floyd estate is actually a really small portion of the estate that William Floyd and his children would have owned. Uh, you'll see, you know, we have the Tri Hamlet. You'll see on the left hand side, this sort of squiggly river, that's the Carmen's River. Uh, Wertheim National Wildlife Refuge is based on, along that river. That river is a major route, uh, historically speaking, for Native Americans and later European colonists moving up and down into Suffolk County and from the Great South Bay. You'll see on the right hand side, the sort of wider, more like V shaped river. Uh, that is the Forge River. And the Forge River, I sort of grew up right along the For Forge River, is this really dynamic ecosystem. There are a lot of different birds, um, a lot of different fish, a lot of really cool things that you can see right from the Forge River there on the right hand side. Zooming in a little bit closer, we can see some of the names Floyd Point there on the outskirts of the William Floyd Estate, named obviously after the Floyd family. Uh, you can see Osprey Park just a little north of the William Floyd Estate. You can see the name of the creek that the William Floyd Estate is situated along that is Home Creek, named Home Creek obviously because it was an access point for the Floyds to get back home uh, if they were out fishing, sailing, or doing other activities on the Great South Bay. I always like to point out just a little further than Home Creek, you'll see a name called Lawns Creek. Lawns Creek is actually this really cool site, also a very dynamic habitat, really beautiful. A lot of homes built along there, a lot of docks, a lot of people have their boats along Lawns Creek. The name Lawns Creek actually comes from a gentleman by the name of London Edwards, uh, who was an enslaved worker on the William Floyd property. So I always love looking at that as the site where uh, a worker who actually worked at the William Floyd estate, his name is still inscribed within the landscape. It was called Lawns Creek because that is right along the area where his cabin and other cabins from workers and enslaved vibrant community that existed right out in that area that is today more or less neighborhood. And then up a little further, of course, you get towards the Puspatuck Reservation, which we'll talk a little bit about later on. Am I uh, cutting out? I just got a signal that said I had an unstable connection. Oh. Sorry, you, you did cut out when you started to talk about Lon Lons Creek and it picked up again when you said Puspatuck, so the in-between was missing. Cool, thank you. Yeah, so I was mentioning Lawns Creek is actually named after London Edwards, who was an enslaved worker at the William Floyd estate back during the colonial period and the post-colonial period. Um, yeah, and it's, it was named after him actually because his cabin was there. There were quite a few cabins that were there that were built, that were for, that were used by both enslaved and indentured servants. Um, and that was almost a, a midway point between the William Floyd estate and the Puspatak Reservation, which we'll be talking about a little later. Sort of the lay of the land. Now, real quick, I wanna talk about the landscape itself. If you ever visit the Floyd Estate, this is a pretty common scene. This is probably pretty familiar for anyone from the Tri-Hamlet area. Uh, kind of scrubby forest, uh, a lot of thicket, a lot of viney plants, uh, a lot of you know pine trees, a lot of sort of uh, young trees, things like that. You might also see wildlife in an area like this, things like foxes, 
deer, we get box turtles, we get uh, snapping turtles, we get snakes, we get nesting bald eagles at the William Floyd Estate, which is really cool. I've seen the little chicks right on top of the poles uh, getting ready to fledge. We also get groundhogs and turkey, lots, tons of turkey um, on the property. Every single morning I get there before pretty much anyone else, and there's a flock of at least like 10 turkey right there, right on the front lawn. So it's, it's really cool for that reason. Um, I will say, if you were visiting the Floyd Estate during the colonial period, you probably wouldn't have seen many of these scrubby little forests, right? This is actually a relatively recent phenomenon. If you had visited during the colonial period, what you would have likely seen would have been large agricultural fields. The William Floyd Estate was an active plantation. It was a farm, so most of this would have actually been cleared away a long time ago it would have been made flat and open space for growing all sorts of different things. You would have seen, um, and before that, even before it was cleared away for agricultural land, you would have seen a much thicker forest, uh, a much more mature forest, which might have included taller trees, older tree species. You would have seen things like maples and oaks. You would have possibly seen a relatively clear understory, maybe not as much of these vines that would be growing here. Um, but there still would have been quite an abundance of wild animals in that habitat. Um, I want to begin our journey here at the space before the arrival of Dutch and English colonists, uh, because I think that when we're talking about the Floyd estate and we're talking about the history of the people at the Floyd estate, uh, the first people were certainly not the Floyds themselves. So just to real quick talk a little bit about the first people who arrived um, at the Floyd estate. Uh, the first people, well, I actually want to talk about the land. I'm sorry, I, I skipped a, a slide. The next slide, we'll talk about the first people. This is about the land before the Floyd estate. Most of the land that we know of today as Long Island um, probably formed sometime after the end of the last ice age. We have these great ice sheets, uh, these massive glaciers up north. They would have ran down through the mountains. They would have ground up all sorts of material. And when they melted, they left behind all of the material that would have been eventually become Long Island, would become Fire Island, would become all of these barrier beaches that we have uh, in New England and down the coast. Um, also, as sea levels rose, you would, have had, uh, you would have had water coming in, sort of surrounding the island and actually forming it slowly over time. If you ever travel from the north shore of Long Island to the south shore of Long Island, one of the funny things that you're going to notice is that on the north shore, there are a lot of big, large boulders, a lot of pebbles, a lot of rocks, things like that. You go to the south shore, it's a lot of flat, sandy material. That's because you can imagine this, this glacier melting away. And as this glacier melts away, it's going to drop behind rocks. It's going to drop behind boulders. It's going to drop behind all of the heavier materials. Meanwhile, the lighter materials, which is going to be like sand, clay, things like that, that's going to be washed away from the glacial moraine out further south. Uh, and that's why you'll notice places like the William Floyd Estate are actually particularly sandy in compared to the places up north, right? Um, the resulting uh, fields that we have have really sandy soil at the Floyd Estate. And that's important for agriculture. It's going to have a big impact on the kinds of things they grew out there um, and the kind of industry that really took hold on early, in, you know, in the early colonial period. Um, of course, the Europeans were not the first people uh, to make it out to Long Island. The first people were likely um, Paleo-Americans. Uh, they might have arrived as, uh, well, a couple thousand years ago after the end of the last Ice Age. Uh, they would have passed originally from Asia across the Bering Land Strait land bridge, which would have existed. Again, we're imagining the Ice Age. There's a ton of ice, which means sea levels are generally lower. As a result, People would have been able to travel from Asia over into North America. They would have headed south down into like the center of what is now North America, and then eventually started to migrate uh, further east to where we are today. Um, the first people who arrived <laughs> on Long Island would have been Paleo-Indian uh, big game hunters. So these would have been people uh, probably around um, like 12,500 years ago. Uh, they would have been searching for big game like deer. Uh, they would have been looking for things like shellfish, fish, even whales. 
vehicles. A lot of them would eventually adopt whaling as major industry. Um, as the area got warmer, many of the Paleo-Americans settled down into communities and tribes. They began to have somewhat more very nomadic. would have traveled from winter to summer, um, but they might have settled down and really took advantage of the shellfish, the fish, and all of the other things. You know, we have uh, quahog clams are very common on uh, in the Great South Bay, on Fire Island, and at the William Floyd Estate. These quahog clams were a very valuable source of food for the uh, Paleo-Americans who would have been visiting. Um, and they were used quite often to actually make beads, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we've also seen uh, them fishing for things like striped bass, a lot of things that we still fish for today. And then a later, later Native Americans would actually uh, participate in the whaling industry as one of Long Island's sort of formulative industries, one of the early industries that really uh, took off out here. Uh, so just on the note of the quahog clam, quahogs are really interesting because they give us a lot of information about between different groups of originally Paleo-Americans and later Native American tribes. Um, you can find quahog clams in the forms of beads, beads that are used to make jewelry, jewelry that is used and traded as currency. You can find that bringing quahog clams from places like Long Island all the way to the center of the tree. Um, so these were really valuable, really important resources for Native Americans. Now, the earliest residents of what would become the William Floyd Estate uh, are people that are still around. They would have been members of the Uncachog Nation. Um, the Uncachog Nation was the first officially or formally recognized Native American nation in what would become the United States. It was originally recognized in 1659 by the state of New York, uh, sometime after the arrival of the first Europeans, originally Dutch settlers, especially out towards the west end of Long Island, later English settlers, you would have seen a lot more English settlers on the uh, east end of Long Island. Uh, for centuries, uh, Uncachog uh, were, were employed as skilled hunters and fishermen. Um, they, were, they were actually very famous as whalers. They were employed quite often by William Floyd and his family to harvest whales from the ocean. They were excellent whalers. Um, they were also skilled craftsmen involved in that whole industry I was mentioning before, wherein they would take quahog clams, turn them into beautiful pieces of jewelry, and use that jewelry as a kind of currency um, within their trading network. Again, that went pretty far inland. Um, Uncachog artisans were at hard at work. Um, they would have had very close relationships to both the William Floyd uh, family and all of the other settlers in the area. Uh, they would have traded all sorts of goods and materials. They also would have worked at William Floyd's farm. Um, so there is all of this connection between the Uncachog nation and the William Floyd estate. And in fact, the Uncachog would have been the first people living out at the William Floyd estate. Today, the Uncachog Nation is centered in Puspatuck, which is tucked into Mastic Beach. It's just a little further north of the William Floyd State. Now, the first Europeans to arrive, again, would have been the Dutch settlers much further west. Then you would have eventually started to see more English settlers as we get towards like the you know, mid to late 1600s. Um, the uh, land that, was, that would become the William Floyd Estate was originally deeded by the King of England to a gentleman named Colonel William Tangier Smith, uh, which is maybe a name that a lot of people are familiar with, especially if you're a local in the area. Uh, Colonel William Tangier Smith uh, is the namesake for the school Tangier Smith. Um, so that's like, that's like a cool little reference point, a little chain of connection. Um, so his family would have actually uh, been deeded the, what would become the Manor of St. George in 1696. That manor was one of 23 manors that were established by the King of England across America. Most of them centered in New York, a few of them centered in New England. It was thought at the time that these manors would operate in a very specific way to bring people from Europe over to 
uh, the colonial er area. Um, but it, it, kind of, it kind of backfired. The whole idea around these manors was that these manors were supposed to reproduce the sort of aristocratic landscapes of England. Uh, you would have had these large manors in England. They would have been overseen by a lord or some other person with a, a high status in life, uh, somebody who had dominion over the land, who had control over the land. And they would have basically entered these agreements uh, with a lot of the, the what we would have called peasantry uh, to maintain that land. People would have farmed in exchange for places to live and things like that. The hope was that with these 23 manors, including the manor of St. George, they would be able to reproduce that system and, and actually convince people in the old world to immigrate over to the new world, to basically travel from England to uh, Long Island and the other manors uh, and settle on that land. Um, the reason why it backfired though, is because we're talking about a lot of, a lot of land. So if you're a peasant in England, and you're thinking about coming to the new world, uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for you to travel from, the, from a manor that you live on in the old world to a new manor in the new world, especially when you can pay off your debts and move just outside of the manor. So while, we, while they established these big manors, a lot of the settlement actually happened on the outskirts of those manors, especially on the part of peasants and working class people, um, people who didn't necessarily want to find themselves under the domain of these manors. And so over periods of time, these manors sort of shifted uh, from being these centers of what they thought would be this sort of communities, this commerce center, um, basically to just being like large plots of land that the person like William T uh, Tanger Smith could sell away over time in order to maintain his wealth. And so that's what he did, because nobody wanted to move to the manor. They sort of moved to the outsides of that manor. Um, and over time, he sold off parcels of his land. Um, just looking at my notes. Uh, it quickly became apparent that without like the proper uh, number of peasants to sort of work the land, that you couldn't really maintain any kind of settlement. And over time, again, Colonel Tangier Smith and others in his family sort of slowly sold away these plots of lands. Um, the land that became the William Floyd estate is actually within an area that was originally deeded in perpetuity to the people of the Uncachog Nation. Um, despite that deed, uh, that paperwork that was done by Tangier Smith in exchange for some uh, guarantees about other land holdings, um, despite that, William Tangier Smith sold the land that would become the William Floyd estate to Richard Floyd II in 1718. So now Richard Floyd II is the first Floyd that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, Richard Floyd II was born in 1661. He was the son of Richard Floyd, who first emigrated from Brecknockshire, Wales. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, so if there's anyone familiar with Wales, you got to let me know. Brecknockshires is how I describe it, Wales. Um, it was not uncommon for Welsh and Scottish settlers in particular to settle in the New World. Um, many of them would actually settle further inland towards Appalachia, but there's a lot of uh, Scottish and Welsh roots on Long Island and in New England. A lot of these people would have been people who uh, were part of somewhat uh, affluent and aristocratic families, but they were maybe like the, uh, the youngest sibling of a, of a whole set of siblings. People who were set pretty far away from the inheritance. People who were both affluent, pretty wealthy, but they would not have had access to the manor. They would not have had access to those old estates because their brothers and sisters uh, might be the ones actually inheriting it. So Richard Floyd, Richard Floyd II's father, was the first Floyd to arrive in the New World. Um, we believe he actually might have traveled briefly to Barbados before he settled originally in New England, and then he eventually moved to Long Island. Uh, he lived on the North Shore of Long Island, and again in 1718 his son purchased the William Floyd estate for the Floyd family. It's unclear exactly when Richard Floyd the I uh, settled on Long Island, but we do have records of a home that he had in Huntington in, six, in the 1660s, the late 1660s, really. Um, 
So from the earliest days of the Floyd fam- the, the Floyd family here, um, they had all of these all of this land in these sort of profitable estates. Um, and they took advantage of all of these complicated contracts in order to sort of slowly dispossess native Long Islanders of the land. Um, and they would have employed uh, indentured servants, they would have employed free labor, and eventually they would have employed enslaved laborers as well in order to work that land. In 1724, Richard Floyd II's son, Nicol Floyd, became the first person to live uh, on the property we now know as the William Floyd estate. Um, he built the what we call today the Old Mastic House, the first portion of the Old Mastic House in 1724. And from there, he actually oversaw the management of the plantation, the manor estate. Um, over the years and through the labor of employed Ankachog, again, who are nearby, indentured servants and enslaved Africans, the estate's grounds were cleared away and developed uh, into a profitable plantation. Uh, they would have grown corn, they would have grown wheat, they would have grown flax and other crops. Of course, the soil here uh, wasn't the best soil for planting. And so a big part of the uh, financial side of the early William Floyd estate um, was actually driven not by uh, planted crops, but mostly by cattle, cows, sheep, pigs, things like that, chickens, and ducks. There was a huge demand for meat in the area. And for the most part, you could actually grow what you needed to subsist and to feed your animals off of the uh, William Floyd estate. So you would have had all of this uh, crop being grown, fed to things like cows, those cows then being sold uh, to market. And that is how the William Floyd family, once they arrived in the new world, they started to really accumulate a lot of both uh, wealth and also status, right, as these as these major, major plantation farmers um, on the east end of the south shore of Long Island. So again, I mentioned the uh, estate originally extended from the Great South Bay up towards the Brookhaven La- National Laboratory. We're talking about a massive tract of land, especially compared to what it is today. Um, it was about 4,400 acres uh, at its height. Today, it's the William Floyd Estate, the place that we call the William Floyd Estate, which is just part of it, um, is around 643 acres, I believe. Now, so then we move a little bit further ahead to William Floyd himself. Uh, William Floyd is the son of Nicol Floyd, the gentleman who built the first portion of the house in 1724. Um, Nicol Floyd uh, ended up passing his inheritance on to William Floyd. He actually passed away uh, in 1755 at a time when William Floyd was fairly young. So William Floyd, when he ended up inheriting the estate, this plantation that he then had to manage, that he had to take care of, he was only 20 years old. Um, And then in that moment, he became one of New York's most prominent landowners, which I think is pretty like, uh, imagine waking up, you know, your father just passed away and now you've got to manage this massive estate. He had, again, 4,400 acres of land, as well as all of the contracts, all of the debt, all of the uh, business relationships that his father had cultivated, they were all passed down to William Floyd. And that all, including, of course, enslaved workers, um, indentured workers as well, who were contracted to the family. At the height of the William Floyd estate, uh, William Floyd was one of the largest slaveholders on Long Island. We believe he held at least 20 people, um, at times fewer, um, usually around like 13 or so. And they would have been employed to both construct portions of the house, they would have been building roads, they would have been helping to cultivate the fields as well. So they were a big part of the early development of the William Floyd estate. And they were really the people who enabled ultimately William Floyd's um, wealth and status. Um, William Floyd was described as a pretty stoic person. He wasn't well educated like many of his siblings, many of his neighbors. He actually didn't go to school. Again, he was 20 years old when his father passed away and he took over the estate, took it over for his family. Um, So he was a well-read person. Most of what he would have been reading would have been things like almanacs. He was really well studied on farming, very specifically. He was pretty well studied just on his own time, reading books about statecraft and about uh, politics and things.
most of what he knew. Throughout him, his life, William Floyd proved himself to be a really competent statesman. He was a very uh, good politician. Oh, it says I have an unstable connection. Did, that, did I lose you? I don't believe we lost much. No, you're still there. Okay. Uh, we just cool. lost a little bit in the education part, but I think we got it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, he was sort of self-taught. Um, pretty much. But so throughout his life, William Floyd proved himself to be a really competent statesman, po politician, he was also a good businessman. Um, in 1770, uh, he received a commission as a colonel in the Suffolk County militia. And so that's really going to set him on the path towards what we all know William Floyd for today. Um, he was also in 1774, just four years after he was made a colonel in the Suffolk County Militia, he joined, uh, he was elected as representative to the first and second Continental Congresses in 1774. So he was somebody who would have been very involved in local church affairs. He would have known many of his neighbors very closely. He was this big businessman. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of influence and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, pull, on, especially on Eastern Long Island, which is really why people entrusted him to be a uh, representative at the Colonial Congresses. And then, of course, most famously, I think the thing that we always talk about when we talk about William Floyd, um, he became one of just four New York signers of the Declaration of Independence. Um, I'm going to make my screen smaller because I can't point at stuff. And I like to point out uh, William Floyd is, I'm looking very close at my screen in this painting. He's usually tucked in right around here. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of an exciting <laughs> thing to look at. He looks kind of grumpy in the painting, um, but he was well known as a very stoic man. Um, there's a great quote about how, <laughs> how stoic he was. Another, another representative at the Continental Congress, when they were signing the Declaration of Independence, uh, looked at William Floyd and said, man, you're so tough. If we end up hanging for this, uh, you'll kick half an hour after I'm gone. <laughs> so he was a tough guy. So he signs the Declaration of Independence. Uh, but of course, like William Floyd is actually not the beginning of this, of this family story, right? Um, Richard Floyd, the second son, Richard Floyd III, who would have been William Floyd's uncle, the brother of Nicol Floyd, um, he was actually arrested in 1776 on charges of sedition against the king. So there is like this connection between him and his brother and his uncle and the sort of intergenerational dynamics. A lot of people were at the time really thinking about independence, really thinking about pushing away from the King of England. And there is this obviously very deep irony in the fact that William Floyd was both a signer of the Declaration of Independence, somebody who advocated for freedom and independence for the country. And of course, he was also one of the largest slaveholders on Long Island. Um, that is an irony that is really deeply embedded uh, at the core of our history. It's, a, it's actually a very interesting thing, I think, to think about. Of course, when William Floyd signed the Declaration of Independence, it wasn't just, oh, he just signed this thing. It was a big deal. Signing the Declaration of Independence meant that he was on a path to potentially execution um, uh, for sedition against the king. Him and all of the other founding fathers were immediately in the, uh, you know, in the crosshairs of the British Empire, which at the time was the largest and most successful empire in the world. So this was a big deal. He was risking his life. He was risking his family's life. He was risking his wealth, his inheritance, his property, and all of those things in order to declare himself a patriot. And of course, uh, William Floyd knew, because he was a Long Islander, he talked to all of his friends. He knew that Long Islanders were actually very, uh, or like generally, uh, not super excited about independence. Uh, they were somewhat hesitant in many places to rise up against the king. His own family members were very hesitant, very skeptical of the idea. Many of William Floyd's neighbors were actually loyalists. Um, the American Revolution kicked off quickly after he signed the Declaration of Independence with British forces moving to occupy New York in an effort to cut off supply lines between uh, New England up north and the South Virginia uh, further down south. The agricultural economy and the industrial economy, you had New York right here in the middle and they wanted to break that, break all of those different trade routes. Um, so that meant that Long Island was and the William Floyd estate was right in their crosshairs. 
Um, pretty quickly after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the first British vessels arrived actually present within today what we call today the Great South Bay, which I was really surprised to learn about. I can't imagine large ships in the Great South Bay, but they actually traveled through an old inlet, which is called Old Inlet. Today there is a breach at Old Inlet that some of you guys might know about. He actually, they actually traveled through that Old Inlet to cross Fire Island and landed themselves right off of the Manor of St. George, where they laid siege to the Manor of St. George, basically seized that land. A small battle was fought there um, to wrest control of it. You had these patriots in the Suffolk County militia. They were unfortunately forced to retreat pretty quickly into that battle. As Redcoats marched down what we know today as Neighborhood Road, many of you have probably driven down Neighborhood Road. If you visit the William Floyd Estate, you'll be passing down Neighborhood Road. Redcoats actually marched down that down a trail that used to be Neighborhood Road, road became Neighborhood Road. Um, William Floyd and his family were actually uh, fleeing Long Island. They were heading up north to the north shore of Long Island, where they were then planning on hoping to catch a ferry, catch a ship over to New England. That's where they actually spent almost the entire duration of the war, um, off of Long Island. In New England, they would have traveled back and forth between New England and upstate New York, um, but they were more or less war refugees for the duration of the war. There was actually a lot of tension because of that. A lot of the New Englanders didn't really love the refugee Long Island patriots who were coming over, uh, and William Floyd and his family might have had a little bit of an uncomfortable time. Of course, William Floyd, again, is a really affluent and wealthy person, and he would have been, uh, he would have probably been pretty well taken care of him and his family. Now, British forces soon pushed militias out of, uh, back into New York, back into New York City, and eventually back into upstate New York. They scored a decisive victory uh, against American forces at the Battle of Bald Hill, and that is sort of like uh, the nail in the coffin for the revolution out here on Long Island. Um, Long Island remained a loyalist stronghold for the duration of the war, um, but of course that's not the whole story. There were a lot of underlying tensions. There was a lot going on underneath. Some of you guys have probably heard about Washington spying. Many of the most influential, the most knowledgeable, the most connected British officers would have actually been stationed on Long Island. They would have had their base of operations on Long Island, which meant that a lot of loyal sort of patriots um, were able to actually intercept quite a bit of information from them over time. So even though Long Island was more or less a loyalist stronghold, you would have had a lot of patriots or a lot of uh, American sympathizers passing information, spying, and even sabotaging the British uh, here on Long Island. Um, so this all happened while William Floyd was gone. Um, red co Redcoats actually quartered inside the old Mastic House. So that old white manor we saw before, they actually stayed inside there uh, for the duration of the war as a sort of base of operations. They also repossessed crops uh, and livestock and they used that in order to feed their occupying forces. There is one really cool family account that comes actually several generations later, something that was written down by a family member um, for posterity, uh, but apparently there was one person who was left behind at the William Floyd estate. So while William Floyd left, he brought all of his laborers, he would have brought his enslaved uh, workers with him as well. There was one gentleman by the name of Uncle Steve, who was an enslaved worker. He stayed behind at the William Floyd estate. He was entrusted by the family to keep an eye on it, to see what the British were doing, basically to report back any damage that they were doing to the property or any materials that they were stealing from the fields and things like that. So for the duration of the war, there was one enslaved worker who lived or stayed at the William Floyd estate in order to see, uh, in order to watch over it for the family. I think that's one of the coolest stories that comes out of that period. Oh, I think, oh, I, uh, sorry, I got a, uh, I got stuck. All right, so when he signed the Declaration of Independence, William Floyd marked his name in the history book. Uh, is the reason why so many things around us are named after this gentleman. But William Floyd's career didn't end there. And of course, it didn't start just with William Floyd. He, of course, had the support of his children.
was sort of crafting what would become a very important part of American history. He, of course, also had his uh, free servants. Oh, it says I have an unstable connection. I'm just checking in. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so there were all of these people people who really enabled William Floyd. And, and that's why when I say, you know, I grew up in Mastic Beach, I really love this place and I love the history of the area. I know William Floyd well, um, but I say William Floyd is really just the tip of an iceberg. He is just one part of this massive story of all of those people who enabled in order to make a free and independent America. So this is a painting of William Floyd. This was actually painted a little while after the end of the American Revolution, after he returned. Uh, he first returned to the William Floyd estate in 1783. Um, he actually didn't end up settling on the William Floyd estate. He ended up settling upstate in Westernville, New York. He would have passed his estate on to his son. But you can see in the distance the old mastic house. It's changed quite a bit. You can see that the fields were a little bit more open at the time. We can see the central house still. You can see the eastern wing of the house um, that is still there today. And of course, there's the western wing of the house on the left hand side that is no longer there. Though if you visited, you could see actually the foundations, little bricks in the ground that sort of indicate where that old, where that old wing would have been. But the story doesn't end there, of course. I'm gonna to have to start wrapping it up because we're getting towards time. Um, William Floyd is retired to Westernville, New York, but he passed his estate on to Nickel Floyd II. At one point though, he visited the William Floyd estate. Uh, he visited his old estate. He actually brought along with him Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Uh, they were reminiscing about the revolution and that's right around the time that painting was painted. So there is like a connection between this painting and uh, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. That's what the estate more or less would have looked like when they visited. Now, Thomas Jefferson was really interested in Native American culture. He was very especially interested in Native American language. So when he visited William Floyd at his old property, what we know as the William Floyd estate, he made a point to travel over to Cuspatuck and actually recorded many words in the original Uncachog language. Um, one of those words would have been mastic, which is a word that we're all probably familiar with. We know mastic and mastic beach. Mastic, mastic, of course, means running water. And that name remains with us today. It's implanted and marked on the landscape. Of course, slavery was a really important part of the early economy of the William Floyd estate. But over time, obviously, uh, people started to see that slavery was this really aberrant institution, this really um, uh, morally bankrupt institution, essentially. And so New York State actually started to pass a series of what were called gradual manumission laws. Um, this wasn't the same as outlawing slavery, uh, but it was more like slowly over time trying to phase it out. Um, this photograph is actually a photograph of a gentleman named Charles Murray. Charles Murray, what we believe, we're not 100% sure, we're still doing so much research on the people who lived and worked at the Floyd estate, but we believe Charles Murray was born in 1804. He was likely born to an enslaved person um, and indentured under the terms of gradual manumission until his 28th birthday. Um, after his 28th birthday, he actually continued to live on the estate. Um, he worked for the family until he passed away in 1898. So this is a gentleman who lived for a very long time. Um, and I always just really love coming back to this photograph. I think it's a really interesting sort of glimpse into an earlier time. So the Floyd family over the generations, obviously they sort of phased out slavery as well. They ended up eventually condemning slavery and many of them actually, or one of them, one of, I, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but he actually participated in the Civil War fighting for the Union. So you do see these changing ideas over generations um, as people sort of rethink about the legacy of this property, this history, and this idea again of freedom and independence and what it really means to be free and independent. Um, Today we're conducting a lot of research on both the enslaved workers who would have worked on the property and also indentured servants, uh, immigrants who would have been employed sort of towards the end of the 1800s. You saw a lot more Irish immigrants on the property and things like that. We really wanna know the big story of the William Floyd estate, which again is just not about William Floyd himself only. Uh, that's just the tip of this deep, deep iceberg. 
Um, so over time, the Floyds would actually abandon agriculture. Um, most of them uh, inheriting sort of affluence wealth, the name uh, that people recognize, they actually started to move a lot into politics, into law, into science and things like that. And over time, they sold off bits and pieces of their William, you know, of their estate. Um, and it became smaller and smaller and smaller. That original 4,400 acres shrunk to around 613 that we have today. At what used to be called Home Neck, what was called Home Neck is what we today call the William Floyd Estate, which was just part of the William Floyd Estate more broadly. Um, so they sold bits and pieces of it. Uh, eventually the house sort of settled into this place where it was no longer a plantation. They were maybe farming a little bit for subsistence. They would have had cattle, they would have had sheep, they would have had flax and oat and other things growing around. Um, but what it really transformed into for the family uh, was more or less a vacation spot. They came out here in the summers to enjoy the Great South Beach, what we know as Fire Island. Um, they would have been going out to the beach. They would have been using it as a hunting preserve. Uh, they would have been using it to cool off, uh, very much the way that we visitors use it today as a place to visit, as a place to think about our, our shared heritage or history here on Long Island, and also just to enjoy a nice cool breeze coming up the Vista View, uh, which is this great little gateway to the Great South Bay. Uh, sometimes gets a really nice breeze up there. So uh, from 1724 to 1976, eight generations of Floyd family lived in the old Mastic House. They would have played in the attics. There are all sorts of crazy and really cool stories of the kids rummaging, finding Civil War outfits and putting them on, playing dress up. And we have a lot of really great photographs and a lot of really great materials from that huge swath of American history. And again, you can really see how ideas have changed over time and how the family has adapted to that change. In 1976, Cornelia Floyd Nichol deeded 1600, uh, I'm sorry, 613 acres of what again was called Home, home Neck, uh, what we now call the William Floyd Estate, to the National Park Service for its preservation. And it was decided because both of its proximity and its historical connection to Fire Island, that Fire Island National Seashore would manage it. And so Ireland National Seashore still oversees the William Floyd Estate today. Those are the folks that I, uh, that I work for. That's where I'm coming from. Um, and so there are all of these really profound historical connections between these two places that really make them, uh, in, situate them in relation to each other. So I just want a real fit, quick finish with a plug. I'm really proud of this self-guided tour that we developed. If you guys are interested in taking a cool self-guided audio tour and you have a smartphone, you have a pair of headphones, um, you can download the National Park Service official app. This is not just an app for Fire Island National Seashore. It's an app for all of the National Park Service. You can download it. When you download it, you'll see in there Fire Island. When you click on Fire Island, you'll see self-guided tours. And there is a self-guided tour of the William Floyd Estate that you can do while you're there. It's GPS enabled, so it'll walk you around to where you want to go. Or you could just scroll through it if you want to, if you're at home and you want a little bit more information. You'll hear my voice narrating everything. I really hope you like it. Um, so check that out. And of course, please visit we're open seven days a week now. So when you visit, uh, look for rangers, you'll see us around. And if you have any questions, please feel free to let us know. Um, so just to finish off, my name is Kelsey. I'm a park ranger at Fire Island National Seashore and the William Floyd Estate. I work for the National Park Service under the US Department of the Interior. And I hope you guys had a good time. We had five minutes. I was planning for like 10 to 15 minutes for questions, but I'm gonna stop sharing and we can take some time to ask questions. Look how cool. I like the background. Hey, thanks. This is, um, this is Squirrel Lane, which is a, a road at the William Floyd Estate that takes you from the old that. Mastic House down towards the Family Cemetery. Um, and it's one of my favorite trails. It's also a really good place to get ticks, so be careful. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, we do get ticks. <laughs> <laughs> like, click us off the video or... We keep coming on, though. Um, so yeah, I see, I'm going in the chat. Are quahog clams uh, chowders? Yeah, uh, they're quite often used for clam chowder. Um, that's a great question, thank you, Anthony. Uh, more often, or sometimes they're called hard shell clams. So if you ever get hard shell clams, 
That's the same thing as a cohog, essentially. Oh, and that was a direct message, so I'm not sure if others would have seen that question. But yeah, yeah, chowders. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, can you just say once again, is the house open? Uh, the grounds are open. The house is not open right now, right? Yes, the house is closed at the moment, again, for some significant renovations that are being performed. The grounds will be open. Uh, somebody asked me when the house will be open again. Uh, I'm not really sure, I have to be honest. If uh, we're, we're actually kind of hoping to bring in some support uh, in order to do more renovations on the house. We're really looking at 2026 as this big date, the 250th anniversary of the United States. So we want to spruce it up as much as possible. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on things like the chimneys, um, as well as the roof. If we can't, if we can't procure funding, if we can't procure support for those renovations, then it'll pretty much just be the roof and the collection, which will probably be a little faster. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that it'll be closed longer, if only because that means we'll be doing more work on it. Um, I really wish I had a better, a better answer for when it will be open. Are there any plans to digitize any of the collections within the archives to share with the public online? Um, that's a good question. That's something that I've been working on a little bit as the uh, Parks uh, Visual Information Specialist. I do a lot of web work. Um, the records that we have are quite extensive and unfortunately digitizing them uh, is not necessarily a significant priority. Really like cleaning the objects themselves and making sure there's no mold is really our main priority right now. That said, our archivist is an open book. So if you are ever interested in looking for specific records, if you had a question, if you wanted to know if we might have some specific record on hand, um, you're always welcome to contact the William Floyd estate. Our archivist will be in touch with you and she would be happy to provide you with any specific materials um, or really just like look for them um, that you might be requesting. So I'm sorry to say, yeah, we will digitize them. It might take some time. In the meantime, if there's something you need, let us know and we'll try to find it for you. Very good. Um, somebody asked, is the Manor of St. George open? Um, the Manor of St. George is actually operated on a private land trust, so it's not National Park Service, it's not public park, it's not county or anything like that. Um, I have to say the Saint Manor of St. George is sort of open quite sporadically. Um, I've not had a chance to visit in several years myself. Um, every now and then you'll see it open and uh, I'm sorry to say I, I don't really have any information as to who you can contact or who you should reach out to if you wanted to get in there. Well, that's great, Kelsey. Thank you so much. It was fascinating. Very yeah. fascinating. <laughs> I hope you guys had a good time. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or any other park rangers. Um, yeah. <laughs> and very I'll take more questions, but uh, it was yeah. really nice to meet very you. Very good. Well, well, people are, if you still have a question, feel free to throw it in the chat or interrupt me while I talk. I'll do, I'd like to let everyone know that we're going to have Fire Island National Seashore back with us next month. We have another program scheduled. Um, it's all about sharks. Um, our next scheduled program will be on Wednesday, August 11th, and that's at 7 p.m. right here on Zoom. And you can register for this program through the library at communitylibrary.org website, or give us a call at 399-1511, extension 240. Um, I have enjoyed this presentation. I might be speaking to Kelsey to see if we can maybe get a little inside peek of the William Floyd Manor itself while you're going through and doing some restoration and cleaning. That would be fascinating to see, um, a little bird's eye view on how that all works. Um, but we'll chat, we'll talk, uh, we'll see what we can do. Um, and with that, I'd like to say good night. Thank you all for coming and we'll Thank see you, you again Thank next you, time. Thank you. Thank you. Out anytime. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. bye guys. Bye. Thank you. Very nice. I'm going to check Paul Joe. Thank you. If you like.